between. In between, there is the Venus sinus. So you need to look for the Venus sinus. So in this case, will be appropriated not only to do contrast, but maybe to call back the child and to do a, a CTV. Okay, so CT venography. Why? Because you can have inflammation in between, and of course, this is an MR, and you can have thrombosis of the sinuses as a, a consequence or complication of the mastoiditis and in association with the mm, uh, cerebellar abscess. So you see where the, the abscess is, and then you think of uh, the possible complication and you explore the complication. If you have an MR, it's very important that you do an MR. Now, if you don't have, you just do a CTV. The important thing I want to tell you about our protocol for MR, so uh, our protocol is um, uh, based on MRI, MRV, and MR with contrast. Why we do contrast? Because if you do a 3D gradient, like the stealth sequence that the neurosurgeon used to before the operation, or 3D sequences, with contrast, because uh, this is a gradient sequence, the veins will be full of contrast. So you will have a CTV-like uh, venography. And this is important because sometimes the MRV, so MR venography that works without contrast, can be a tof 2 d or face contrast, uh, has some limitation and can fool you because either the, 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 the plan of acquisition or the, the some technical settings, I don't want to go in details, but I'm happy to answer some question about that, or uh, sometimes you can have um, a problem related to the evolution of the thrombus. While if you do a 3DT1 pre and post contrast, you will have, together with an MRV, you will have all the information to diagnose a thrombus. So remember, if you have an MR, do a 3DT1 post contrast gradient sequence. Okay. Now look at these two scans. Okay. Now we have an obvious uh, um, um, difference here in the hypodensity, but look at the sinuses. They came, both of them, um, uh, uh, from a fellow that called me and say, is this uh, venous sinus thrombosis? Because the signs is hyperdense, this and that. Okay, now, there are a few differences, but the density is very similar, okay? So this can be a thrombosis, but the first things you need to look is, um, uh, probably the second thing you need to look is the shape of the sinus. In this case, it's a bit round. In this case, maintains this tent-like shape. Now, the important thing, though, is not the shape, because, again, the shape, the signal in MR, the shape of the, the sinuses in CT, and in, in general for neuroradiology, the, the, to rely too much on these subtleties can fool you. But one thing very important in pediatric neurology, as, as I showed you last time, last week, is the age, okay? So this is three-week-old age. The, the um, um, hemoglobin is an in, in an infant is very, very dense because it's neonatal hemoglobin. So the, the blood is physiologically dense in a neonate. This is 16-year-old. You should not have this uh, density in the blood, not only this shape. And of course, in this case, you have also ischemia, but... You can have the cases of thrombosis without the skin evident on CT. But if you have any doubt, check all the other. Look at here. This is cortical vein. It has the same density, okay? Um, the rest of the veins, they have the same density everywhere. You look at the artery, same density in infant. In this case, the rest of the veins are not visible. So, um, so of course, the, um, this is pineal thunder. So, of course, the density is limited. The hyperdensity is limited to the area of the thrombus. Okay, so remember, the age is critical. And this is a, no, a well-known pitfall in pediatric neuroradiology. Now, Look at this other terrible scan. This is a CT and uh, about hydrocephalus early signs. This was reported negative. Now, the child has only headaches, okay? And there is no enlargement of the lateral ventricle. So you say, mm, it's fine. This is not hydrocephalus, normal. There are two problems though. Look at the shape of the temporal horns. This 90 degree shape of the temporal horn is quite um, indicative of hydrocephalus. Now, early hydrocephalus. Another thing, look at the third, okay? The third is bulging downwards. You can miss if you do the axial only, but this is why you need to do in every single child you do a CT for, 
sagittal and coronal reformat. So you acquire just one 3D and you do the reformat because in the reformat, I will show you some images before uh, afterwards. In sagittal reformat or sagittal MR, if you have an MR, you will have the anterior and inferior bulging of the third ventricle, again, early sign of hydrocephalus. On top of that, this is the sibius, aqueductal sibius. Where is the fourth ventricle? The fourth ventricle is completely gone. So all the time, look at the fourth ventricle because you can save a child. If you don't see the fourth ventricle, if you have these early signs of hydrocephalus, looking at the temporal horn and um, the third ventricle, uh, you need to do an MR straight away. And in fact, in this case, you couldn't see anything. And you see also it's a bit denser, this area, because there's, there's, there was an hydrocephalus related to a very, very extensive leptomeningeal um, enhancement, okay? Uh, so leptomeningeal um, metastasis for uh, medulloblastoma. Now, uh, in this case, you have a diffuse disease can be differ, difficult to pick it up, although you can see. But the most important thing is that the fourth ventricle is not very visible, okay? And there are signs of early hydrocephalus, okay? So remember, temporal or third ventricle, very, very important. Look at the suicide compression and look at the fourth ventricle if this is the cause of the obstruction. Look at this terrible scan, terrible, 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 terrible. This is a scan, though, that you can uh, use to save the child's life. And this was reported negative outside. This is a scan that Dr. Chong gave me. And uh, uh, again, where is the fourth ventricle? There is no fourth ventricle. You can see the other ventricle. Look at the shape, horizontalized shape of the temporal horn, and look at the inferior bulging of the of the third, despite they didn't put any child filter, look at the strike artifact. Despite you have uh, um, uh, you have very low quality, you can say that there is most likely a mass here and associated hydrocephalus. Okay, and you need to run to an MR. Of course, most of you will have better scans, but you know can happen. And again, this is the worst scenario. So look at the hydrocephalus, and after two days, the child died and this was a medulloblastoma this is the mr post-mortem okay so in this case we are very very helpful and these are scary right but you can really really say a lot now just to show you the difference between an hydrocephalus versus loss of white matter ex vacuo and life so what is that look at this image okay now, this is a child that is born with this enlargement of the fourth ventricle. Now, uh, for those of you that um, uh, the, the Ukrainian uh, colleagues that, that were um, for the um, posterior fossa lecture, this is a posterior fossa cystic malformation called Blake pouch cyst. This is probably there prenatally, and you have that the ventricles are dilated and uh, there is for sure a loss of white matter because the ventricle is uh, very close to the gray matter here. So there is a, an ex vacuo component, but the most important thing, look at the third ventricle, is displaced inferiorly and anteriorly, and also the posterior aspect of the, um, sorry, can I, can you stop sending, uh, um, <laughs> sending chat because they are popping up, but then we can discuss everything, okay? Um, so um, so just I wanted to say that there is the stretching of the corpus callosum, this bulging posterior and anteriorly, and uh, associated with the, with this uh, cystic malformation of the posterior fossa called black palsy. So this is an obstructive hydrocephalus, tetraventricular hydrocephalus here, with an ex vacuo component, completely different from this Look at the third ventricle. Here is flat, okay? There is loss of white matter, a bit of hemosiderin. This is white matter injury of prematurity. And again, there is a very few white matter because of the ex vacuo dilatation. This squaring of the ventricular margin, very typical of ex vacuo dilatation. But also here, there is a bit of squaring. But in this case, it's pure loss of white matter. There is no hydrocephalus, okay? Now, this is hydrocephalus. This is wild matter injury of prematurity. Uh, some people call it PVL, but PVL is a general term that indicates periventricular leukomalacia. 
uh, it's not only for for uh, preterms. You can have also for other children. So please use wide matter injury or prematurity or or prematurity. Or you say this is a PVL uh, in keeping in this clinical context with wide matter injury or prematurity. I try to tell you how I report um, um, because of the experiences or or, or, or or what my colleagues told me. Okay, now. Uh, indication for pediatric head CT, what you should say not to. For headaches, only headaches without neurological signs, you, should, you don't need a CT. Before lumbar puncture, without signs of raised intracranial pressure, you don't need a CT. Single seizure episode, no need CT. Oh, of course, they ask, child doesn't need feel well. So what the clinician ask? Sometimes they ask, CTs come for many, query meningitis. So... Actually, unless you have sign, neurological strong sign that there is a mass, like I show you a big abscess or an empyema, the CT scan will not pick up anything in meningitis because you will have vascular enhancement, okay? So the CT scan is just for big, urgent stuff. Now, the empyemas or the abscesses are typical of pyogenic infection or sometimes fungal, fungal, fungal infection. You will not pick up anything on MR in case of in case of viral encephalitis, which is a clinical diagnosis. So avoid M, uh, uh, sorry on CT. So avoid CT. Do the MR. Okay. See the, uh, the and MR before lumbar puncture to check the position on the tonsil is completely crap indication because again, if you don't have uh, so if you don't have a low tonsil, you will not exclude the possibility of coning, okay? And low tonsil does not predict the possibility of coning. So again, neurological examination. Of course, if the child is in the MR for infection and so on, and they need to do a lumbar puncture, and someone calls you and say, can you have a look to the tonsil? Don't yell at him or her, but just have a look to the tonsil because sometimes they are bad chiari, very rarely, that are completely incidental. But really, remember that the CT and MR should not be used as a predictor of possibility of coning in the um, in pre-lumbar puncture status, okay? So CT is not useful. This is a myth for the diagnosis of meningitis. It's not useful to predict the uh, uh, lumbar puncture complication. In normal CT, does not exclude lumbar puncture complications. So these are myths, okay? Uh, and also, lumbar puncture do not cause tonsil herniation. Now, what are the indications for CT head scan in children in UK? Slightly different in America, but more or less the same. Suspected non-accidental injury, so any trauma without a history, you do a CT straight away. Post-traumatic seizure without history of seizure, GCS that is low in acute, or uh, man, uh, less than 15 after two hours, suspected skull base fracture, focal neurology deficit. So remember the focal, the neurological examination is very, very important. Loss of consciousness for, for more than five minutes or three or more episodes of vomiting, okay? Um, while, oh, sorry, this is still in Italian. Anyway, sp uh, spine CT in a child, when you have def um, definitive diagnosis of uh, spinal anomaly to be excluded, for instance, in pre-op planning. If you have a um, Glasgow coma scale uh, before 13, so a child that is new, is is, is uh, a bad neurologically, once you have a TAC uh, CT of the total body needed, uh, per uh, peripheral neurological signs or signs of neck tissue lesion or X-ray and X-ray not conclusive. So these are the main indication for spinal CT. Now, so this in general, so there are precise indications mostly guided by um, clinics, and you can download the so-called NICE guideline, N-I-C-E, uh, from um, uh, UK. I, I, I described the process of myelination last week. For those of you that were not connected, remember on T2, an adult brain is fully myelinated and there is low uh, T2, uh, basically, uh, in the myelinated uh, uh, white matter and bright in T1. Low in flare as well, the only difference is that we get rid of the hyperintense signal uh, of, uh, the, um, of the uh, CSF. Now, in a two-day-old, so in a neonate, you don't have myelination. So the white matter looks like water, so it's hyperintense in T2 and hypointense in T1. Over time, you have 
that the T2 signal becomes darker, T1 signal becomes brighter. Why? Because the axons are made of lipids and proteins. So what we see, we see the accumulation of lipids and proteins and the reduction of the water. Now, over time, the T2 shows the reduction of the water, okay? And the T1 shows the increase of lipids, okay? So this is why we have this signal. Of course, we can have some problem in myelination. And again, as for the, as I show you for the thrombosis, it's critical to have um, the age of the patient. Two children, both unmyelinated, T2, you see, is hyper intense in both of them. But this is four weeks old, completely normal. I show you these two cases last time. This is two years old, and this is profoundly abnormal hypomyelinating pattern. So this is a polycellus meds pattern. This is, doesn't matter. Remember, to know the normal trajectory of myelination, to understand what is abnormal. You see this in a child two years old with a, a neurological problem, you go straight into um, leukodystrophy problem, in particularly hypomyelination. Now, a few slides about cerebellar uh, embryonal tumors. Uh, just to show you the powerful of uh, uh, some uh, of both CT actually and MR diffusion in identifying the, uh, um, uh, the um, differentiating bad tumor from good tumors in, in children. Now, cerebellar embryonal tumor are divided in atypical teratora abdoid tumor, medulloblastoma, and uh, ETMR, that is um, um, embryonal tumor with multilayer rosettes. Okay? Medulloblastoma is the most common and they have a lot of subgroups. This is not important. What you are interested in is that all the embryonal tumor, all of them, they have high density cells. Blue round cells, are the, as the pathologists describe them, are small cells all packed together and with very few water among the cells. So intercellular, uh, intercellular space is restricted. Okay? Now, this means that there is a CD hyperdensity and DWI restriction. Why there is DWI restriction? As I showed you last time, but repetita juvent, there are the DWI shows the water movement between the cells. Okay, so if you have an acute ischemia, the cells are in the acute phase are swollen up, the water between the cell uh, cannot move so freely, so we, you have diffusion restriction. But also in embryonal tumor, the cells are not big, but they are a lot. So a lot of cells means very few water between the cells, meaning diffusion restriction. Okay, so that's very important when you see a tumor that shows restriction restriction in a child. Think of embryonal tumor. Look at the the the, the um, intensity of the cortex is bright of the tumor is brighter than the cortex, and the cortex is quite packed tissue, right? And the, as I show you, uh, as I told you before, but I didn't show you uh, the, uh, DWI images, pus, so presence of pyogenic abscess, also has a core of the, of the abscess. So this is the, uh, the rim of the abscess, and in the center is a core full of debris, but no water whatsoever. This also shows striking diffusion restriction, and this allows you to distinguish an abscess from a rim-enhancing tumor whose center is necrotic. Now, look at this medulloblastoma, but it's the same for other embryonal tumor, and then we can do all the lecture you want about tumors that I like very much, but, and differential diagnosis, but look at the CT density. Okay, there are two calcifications. That's not important. Tumor can be heterogeneous sometimes, some of them more than others. But look, this is a young, young child, like four years old child, with a, a mass in the fourth ventricle whose density is very similar to the CT, uh, so to the um, uh, gray matter on CT, okay? There is contrast, but the contrast can be pilocyte can have contrast, ependymoma can be done, medulloblastoma, ATRT, it doesn't matter. There is hyperdensity and diffusion restriction. These are the two things you need to look at. This is an hypercellular tumor. It's a young child, so it has to be an embryonal tumor. Whatever it is, in this case, it was a medulloblastoma, but, you know, uh, at the basic level, and then you can distinguish, but at the basic level, you say, this is an embryonal tumor, this is a pilocytic or uh, something else, okay? Look at the pilocytic astrocytoma. Very good prognosis, no diffusion restriction whatsoever. It's more similar to water, so to the fourth ventricle, than to the gray matter. This is the ADC map that basically mirrors the, 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 the DWI, but this is the same sequence, and this is 
bright. Look how bright it is. Bright in ADC, dark in DWI. Here, the other way around, ADC, very, very dark, very cellular. This is not cellular. There is enhancement as before. There is a cyst here, but you can have also pilocytic without cyst. So remember, use diffusion and CT. So in conclusion, uh, neuroradiological anatomy is different in children and child is not a small adult. Uh, adult. Abusive head trauma, which is as we as neuroradiologists call non-accidental injury, needs to be promptly flagged in the report and you need to do the right scans. Do not use urgent brain CT for all the children. You need the neurologist to tell you what to do. Myelination is a dyna dynamic process, but we saw that also in the last uh, um, um, uh, lectures. Uh, lecture. And then uh, aggressive tumor in children, high cellular density. This is a clue for the diagnosis. Okay. Um, this is my email if you want. And these are some ruins uh, in, the, in Campania, where I'm from. Uh, and now uh, I, can, uh, I can open up the discussion. Um, and read some some uh, uh, chat. So if you want, just chat the question. There is uh, there are a couple. Um, in ca in case you found some changes on CT with edema and you are not sure if it's tumor like uh, LGG or abscess, uh, would you always recommend the CT with contrast? So no, if you can do the MR, you do always the MR. Okay, uh, that's the main thing. Um, Low-grade gliomas in children are mostly uh, either pilocytic astrocytoma in the posterior fossa, or you have uh, um, uh, optic pathway glioma. If you have a glioblastoma or something remanencing lesion, uh, you have uh, uh, basically um, uh, that uh, you, you can have a di uh, differential with abscess, but normally. If you have the MR, very easy, you do diffusion. But normally the, the, um, the fever is what changed a lot, okay? So meduloblastoma versus abscess is very easy because the, so the abscess has remanencement. The meduloblastoma normally enhances uh, all of it or quite a substantial part of it. The restriction of the pus is in the core. So normally in abscess you have remanencing and the core, which is restricting, okay? Now, in the, uh, the restriction of the pus is very, very striking, very, very uh, high, because there is no water whatsoever. The restriction of a mass, uh, like a meduloblastoma, is intermediate. But the main thing is the rim enhancement and again, the clinic, okay? Uh, any um, are there any special distinguishing feature between ATRT and meduloblastoma? Yes. So uh, um, um, Anastasia uh, asked me for, for this. This is a very interesting question. So meduloblastoma is divided in four types, and there is all an, a lecture on that, OK? Uh, the main thing is that the meduloblastoma is in the fourth ventricle, at the center of the fourth ventricle, uh, and uh, um, does not have peripheral cysts. ATRT shows peripheral cyst, and all the children are less than three years old. Now, you can have rarely ATRT a bit older, and you can have some meduloblastoma in very young children, but this, uh, the age is more, the age and the heterogeneity, so very young children and uh, very heterogeneous uh, tumor is uh, more typical for ATRT, okay? Uh, on top of that, some of the ATRT uh, can, be typically in the posterior fossa within the pontocerebellar cerebellar angle. Typically, we don't know why. The only uh, the meduloblastoma that can present in the pontocerebellar cerebellar angle is a subgroup called wingless or, or WNT. So, but the wingless tumor, they are really, really um, older children, seven, eight, and they have very good prognosis. So, if you have something that shows diffusion restriction in the pontocerebellar cerebellar, angle in a young child go for ATRT. In an older child go for meduloblastoma. If you have a restricting mass in a young child with peripheral cyst also favor ATRT. Okay? Now uh, other lecture um, 
Can MRI be used to evaluate ocular findings such as uh, retinal hemorrhage in non-accidental injury? Um, so this is for uh, from um, Adaora. So yes, there is a paper from Giulio Zuccoli uh, about the use of SWI for retinal hemorrhages. The main point for me is that first you can have false positives because SWI is full of artifacts over there uh, at the orbit. And second, if you have subdurals and uh, uh, encephalopathic child, you will ask for ophthalmological review straight away. You don't need to jump too much on, on the, on the um, highs that can support your diagnosis, but you need them to confirm your diagnosis. And you, you need also the ophthalmologist to describe the appearances of the subarachnoid hemorrhages because their description is critical to go toward abuse or non-abuse, okay? So yes, you can see them, but I will not push too much on describing and I, I will not try to be too smart on that. that, that let's put it like that. Um, so if I can record the lecture, lecture yeah, normally we... Um, when, when I do um, from my Ukrainian friends, Daria record, but of course I can record the slideshow. Uh, and so, um, so yes, I can record. Now, how often do you see a cavum septum pellucidum? So, so if you have cavum septum pellucidum, I don't know how often, but it's a normal variant. And I would not uh, follow up. The, without neurological indication for a scan, I will not follow up. Sometimes cavum septum lucidum can enlarge, but I mean, the cavum septum lucidum per se is a normal variant. What you may want to follow up is a cyst in the pineal gland. This, um, yes, you, you can follow up. Neurosonography, uh, so, so neuro ultrasound, yes, we. We use neuro ultrasound, but this is mostly the body radiologists do that, and they use for close follow-up of you know some something that is already known or as first screening. So if you have any doubt, you oh, because sensitivity and specificity is quite low, you need to uh, ask for a for a cross-sectional images. But of course, this is very practical. You can do in NICU. It's very fast. There is no radiation. It's very cheap. So yes, use the ultrasound. I don't do myself, but yes, that's very helpful. Abscesses without diffusion restriction. I can do a lecture on abscesses. Um, there are some... Uh, so when you speak about abscess, you are implying pus. So there is diffusion restriction. However, there are some rhythm enhancing uh, lesion like in toxoplasmosis that do not restrict in the center. So when you speak about abscess, you need to see the restriction, but uh, other remanencing infection can, can have, can have. 